Yeah, okay, so the next topic we'll be looking at is the mapping and remapping of the brain. Uh, and really this started in earnest in the uh, 1930s, um, if I can make sure. Yep, so it started in the 1930s using electric probes on conscious patients. You may have seen images of this where the patient is, uh, is conscious and the skull is open and they're probing in the brain. And really what they're doing there is determining what part of the brain processes what activities uh, and yeah they discovered a number of things that the frontal lobes are the motor system and that the three lobes behind the frontal lobe were the sensory receptors etc etc look one of the big things that they found or a major discovery was that the sensory and motor maps were topographical that i.e. areas adjacent to each other on a, a body surface are generally adjacent to each other on a brain map uh, look a topographic order emerges because many of our everyday activities involve repeating sequences in a fixed order it's most efficient to bring that to life somewhat and here's an image over here you know if you to bend over and pick up a ball as a child your shoulder fires and your elbow and your wrist and then your hands and your muscles and they all work in a sequence and it's um, it's found that that sequence was very similar in mapped in the brain uh, so it's most efficient that they're close together uh, so a topographic order was found to exist look I'm desperate to do something uh, to a very cute animal uh, a dastardly act if you will so here's a cute animal uh, in a famous study on kittens um, one eyelid of a kitten was sewn shut in its critical period uh, between three and eight weeks. Sewn shut, I won't do that. Let's add, I don't know, an eye patch, uh, a little bit more humane. Uh, and yeah, when they opened the shut eye after that period, they found a few things. The visual area had failed to develop. Okay, that's kind of expected. It, the eye didn't get any input, so it didn't, ex didn't develop at all. But the kitten was actually blind for life in that eye. Uh, a little surprising, but the brain now has no way of processing information from that eye, so you're blind for life. And the area of the brain that was now processing input from the other eye, that was originally assigned, or usually assigned to, the, say, the left eye, was now working um, for the other eye. So it didn't want to waste any area. The brain rewired itself. Uh, so that's one of the kittens. Now let's let's do some more stuff to animals. Uh, I say that flippantly, but um, yeah, look, I'm sure I would have major issues with the monkeys. They're our closest cousin, so this is why a lot of uh, experiments have done on uh, monkeys for the brain. So um, that's just the way it is. Experiment on monkey number one: uh, they a medium nerve was cut in the mid part of the hand, and the brain maps of the other two nerves in the hand took over the space. So we could say there that you use it or lose it. Uh, an experiment on monkey number two: they sewed two fingers together, and what happened there was the brain maps of the nerves joined together as one. Uh, so what we could say there is that when two neurons fire at the same time repeatedly, chemical changes occur in both so that they connect more strongly. And this is the mantra that neuroscientists use here, is that neurons that fire together wire together. Uh, we don't always have to be so draconian or uh, cut things off or amputate things to, to see how this works. Uh, so uh, that's pleasant. It, it's a normal phenomena, uh, the plasticity of the brain. And to demonstrate that, experiment number three involving a monkey. A trained monkey was uh, a monkey was trained to touch a spinning disc with a with its fingertip for a reward, assuming a banana or something as cliched as that. It really had to pay close attention to this spinning disc. What they found was that the brain map of the monkey was enlarged. It shows that when animals are motivated to learn, the brain responds plastically. And uh, another point is that the higher the proficient they get in the skill, the more efficient and fewer neurons they get, and they process faster and clearer. Uh, and so one of the key points from this is that you have to pay attention. Uh, paying attention is essential for long-term plastic change. Uh, when animals completed tasks that were autom automatically, if you will, their brain maps changed, but the changes didn't last. And so to take something from that, we would suggest that multitasking doesn't lead to lasting change in your brain map. A comment we touched on with the kitten was this very uh, hyper-important kind of area called the critical period. Um, and I'd say here, yeah, through studies mentioned and many others, neuroscientists have learned that there exists a critical period in brain development. Each neural system has a different critical period, during which time it is especially plastic and sensitive to the environment, and during which it has a rapid formative growth. You know, so during the critical period, the brain is always switched on. Why? Why is it always switched on? Well, because when you're young, it is not possible to determine what is important and what isn't. So biologically, it pays attention to everything. And the process itself within the brain uh, 
is a chemical called BDNF, which is brain-derived nootropic factor. It actually turns on the nucleus bacillus, and the nucleus bacillus is the part of the brain that allows us to focus our attention. So change takes place effortlessly, effortlessly because uh, this thing's switched on all the time. And there's some discussion in the book about uh, attempts to try and get this to switch on in adulthood, and that we can uh, learn things uh, at a much faster clip. Uh, I would hope that to happen because I would sign up for any study that would allow me to learn things much quicker. Um, and further to that, we're looking at the human critical period. What is it? Well, they suggest it's from 0 to 8 to 12 um, till puberty. Uh, after this critical period, a person's ability to say, learn a new language without an accent is limited. So this period, um, your nucleus bacillus switched on and you're learning as much as you possibly can and, uh, and learning it most efficiently. And another point here is that I kind of found interesting, so I stick it in here. A second language learned after the critical period is processed in a different part of the brain than the native tongue. If you learn the, a different language prior to the, uh, during the critical period, it's all learned in the one area. But if you'd learn a uh, German, say when you're 26 or 27, um, it's actually processed in a different part of the brain altogether. And here's a point on the critical period. Um, there is a suggestion now that modern environmental factors are contributing to conditions like ADHD and autism. How did they come to this conclusion? Well, look, they expose mice um, to white noise during their critical period. So um, when they're just born, uh, they expose some white noise. What they found is that it actually devastates the cortex. Uh, and if you can then look at some correlation then between what white noise is occurring in modern society, uh, background noise from appliances, from traffic, from aeroplanes, all these things, uh, there's some suggestion now that these, the incidence of these on the rise may be attributed to um, this environmental factors like the white noise that we're experiencing um, through our critical period as, as we grow. Okay, so thank you for buying into all of that. That's mapping and remapping. It's um, one of the more important topics because it covers a lot of what the science is and how we've learned that through the, um, the process of mapping. Okay, so here we are. Okay, so the next topic, uh, sexual attraction and love and how that relates to the brain and brain plasticity. Uh, really, this is just a grab bag of ideas from the book. Uh, the human libido is a not hardwired, invariable biological urge, uh, but it can be very fickle, altered by our psychology and the history of our sexual encounters. The human sexual instinct seems to have broken free from its core purpose reproduction. Apparently, we're doing it for no other reason than to have a good time. Uh, so anthropologists, I found this intriguing, have shown that for a long time humanity did not know that sexual intercourse was required for reproduction. Not sure what we thought we were doing, but we did not think it was uh, creating new humans. Sigmund Freud discovered critical periods for sexual plasticity uh, and that early childhood was the first critical period before puberty. Uh, and during which time we can acquire sexual and romantic tastes and inclinations that get wired into our brains and can have a powerful impact on the rest of our lives. The author talks a little about porn. Uh, the current porn epidemic provides a graphic demonstration that sexual taste can be acquired. Uh, and that pornography is a dynamic phenomena. Uh, and you just have to look at where softcore porn is now. It's what hardcore porn was 30 years ago. And that hardcore porn now explores the world of perversion. So it's a dynamic phenomena. Uh, the author explores a little on the addiction to porn. Uh, so addiction involves long-term neuroplastic change in the brain. That's any kind of addiction, not just to porn. Uh, dopamine, which is a reward transmitter, is released during sexual excitement, activating the brain's pleasure centers. And so that's why um, humans kind of keep gravitating back to that, I guess. Uh, and internet porn now with no cost or barrier to entry, if you will, and it's available 24-7. He's seeing an epidemic of uh, people addicted to porn, uh, certainly um, patients that he's seeing anyhow. Uh, studies have shown that addictions can cause permanent changes in the brains of animals. So the brain produces a protein, I think that's delta FOSB, that accumulates in neurons. This process can lead to genes being turned on or off, leading to irreversible damage to brain's dopamine system, rendering animals far more prone to further addiction. You know, this turning genes on and off is incredible. Uh, a comment on lovers for life, uh, he makes a point, a tolerance akin to a tolerance for a drug can develop in happy lovers as they get used to each other. The couple's plastic brains have so well adapted to each other that it's hard to get some the same buzz they once got. Uh, dopamine loves novelty, so to keep uh, the relationship um, healthy, they suggest making things novel uh, to ensure this drug here keeps getting fired. Okay, so that was sexual attraction and love. Um, I'll just sk skip back to the to the center. 
Okay, pain. Next topic. Here we are. Okay, so uh, V.S. Ramachandran was a doctor, and he was the first physician to successfully amputate a non-existent limb. What? I hear you ask. Uh, okay, often when a limb is amputated, after the operation, a patient is tortured by phantom memories of injury, like gangrene, blisters, etc., that they actually felt in the limb before it was amputated, uh, and thus the concept of a phantom limb. Uh, when the limb was removed, uh, there was no new input to alter the brain map, so the mental representation of the limb as fixed became frozen in time. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the brain hasn't had a chance to process the fact that there's no longer a limb, so it still has a representation of that limb in uh, its uh, image of the body, and, and this pain that the patient's experiencing is very, very real. So V.S. Ramachandran uh, has successfully treated these patients by a mechanism that he used that tricked the brain with an illusion. Uh, and he used something called a mirror box. Uh, it's like something out of a magic show. Uh, really, what he had, how he performed this was to actually perform a mirror box therapy where uh, the patient would, if uh, say they were missing a left arm, they would look at a reflection of their good arm and projected somewhat near where the, the amputated arm would be and this tricked the brain into believing that um, it existed and so if I make the comment here the brain unlearned the pain via false signals sent to the brain to make it believe the limb was actually moving uh, believe it or not uh, most patients find that their pain dissipates or is removed altogether uh, and their quality of life uh, goes through the roof as a result um, as phantom limbs show, we don't need a body part or even pain receptors to feel pain. Uh, and that's an important point. We only need a body image uh, produced by our brain maps. So your own, your own body image is a phantom. Uh, and we talked about this, about this in another topic, that there's a representation of the body in the brain and it obviously can be inaccurate. If we lose a limb, uh, it still feels like the, um, the limbs there. Uh, one practical point that came out of all of this is that the discovery of these pr pain maps has led to new approaches to surgery, i.e. painkillers are actually administered before surgery now in a lot of cases to uh, prevent locked in pain or, or phantom pain. Okay, so that was pain. Uh, I'll jump back to the middle.